Hello, today we're gonna make this explosion with a mix of procedural animation and particle simulation. And you can follow along using the same file I provide in the description. And if you're my patron, you can also have the final files, watch my tutorials teaching how to make the smoke simulation and the lighting you see in this shot as well. Now, let's say you have a Houdini scene with some objects in it that you want to be pieces of the explosion. Here inside the explosion node, I have five different shapes of jelly beans to help making every bean look different. Now, how can I make these beans explode? First, imagine how expensive it can be to simulate hundreds of jelly beans using a bullet solver. It could be unstable, we probably would have to cook a couple versions of the simulation until we are happy with the look and placement of each bean in the air. And if you haven't noticed, in the beginning of the explosion, they are all intersecting with each other. That's a problem if you're planning to simulate it. Actually, we don't even need the beans to interact with each other. We just need to keep them apart after the explosion so that they never touch. That's why, instead of bullets, I decided to use a procedural approach. To make our lives easier, let's use mops. If you don't know mops, it's a library of nodes that immensely helps make motion graphics in Houdini. I use it a lot. And mops actually has a node for turning objects into instances that it can read. So let's add a mops instancer node and connect all these five objects to this node. And you can delete these nodes that I used for preview. And okay, we have to keep them apart, so let's configure. The distribution type is gonna to be fixed number, and let's increase the distance to two in all of this axis. Look, if I open the info pop-up, we see these points are not from the actual geometry of our objects. Instead, each point is representing one object. Okay, this instancer node can distribute the instances in any shape we define. If we set the distribution type to mesh, every point disappears. So we have to grab a mesh into this template object field. And I'm using this jelly bean mesh as my template object. I'd like to create a no and call it out in it. I reference it instead of my source mesh so that I can make upstream changes to it later. Now let's add a transform node, scale up, and change the mesh distribution method to points. Now the instancer node is only placing instances where there is points in the template geometry. In this way, we can control more precisely the placement and number of our objects. But now you can notice that I need the points to be inside the bean and not on the surface. So let's add two nodes, one VDB from polygons and a scatter. This one's gonna be a fog volume with a higher resolution, let's increase it to 0.01 .01. and this scatter is gonna place 4000 points where there is volume. Now, if you disable relax iterations, the jelly beans will look more randomly placed, which is more realistic for an explosion, but also some instances will intersect with each other and we want to avoid it. So keep relax iterations and keep tweaking the parameters until you can't find any bean intersecting. I found the following values are good ones, 71, 1.304 and 4.5. And don't worry about the randomness we just lost because we have better ways to add it back later. Now make sure as well that this transform is placed in the end of the stream. And if you slide the uniform scale up, we are starting to have something that resembles an explosion. So that's a good point to pause and plan the next steps. I could go ahead and keyframe this uniform scale. I would have an initial keyframe here and a final keyframe here. So this is my approach. There are two moments. The initial moment is where the jelly beans are very tightly packed inside the first bean. They can all keep this parallel orientation to fit better. And the final moment is the most expanded version of the explosion that we see in the last frame, where all objects are spinning. Translating this to Houdini language, each moment is defined by one different template mesh. So let's duplicate this null and rename it to out final. Now this is important, always create moments from the same mesh. This avoids the points having different sorting, which can break the animation. Now let's configure both moments. Let's set this uniform scale to 0.21. Let's duplicate this transform and this scale is gonna be 1400, a lot bigger than the previous one. We're not seeing the beans because it's only empty points here, but we can see them in the instancer node. And as you can see, nothing has changed. We are still seeing them in the first moment because this node is referencing the first node and the mesh coming from it is not animated. So we can either animate the template mesh or animate the instances. And since we are assuming each template mesh here is representing a moment, we are not going to animate them. Instead, we are gonna animate the instances using a mops falloff. So let's add a shape 
file off below the instancer and leave it as linear. Turn on preview file off. If we move this file off control, as you can see in the viewport, the blue color shows where the attribute is zero, meaning no influence, and the white shows where the attribute is one, meaning 100% influenced. But to see the movement, we need to add another node, which is mops apply attribute. Let's connect this out final to the second input. This node can copy the attributes and transformations from the points connected to the second input and apply them to whatever comes in the first input. And it uses the file of attribute as a blending factor. You just have to make sure that the name of the attribute here in the file of tab is the same name of our file of attribute. Now, if we move the file of again, you can see how it is blending the positions of each bean based on the color. Okay, now let's adjust some more things. Right now, transition is too abrupt. It looks like a high contrast change that needs to be softened. That's because the falloff is very narrow. So let's set the Z scale to 11. Now the jelly beans are moving a little bit more together. That's cool. But also we need to invert the direction of the falloff for our ramps and animations to look right. For doing this, we can either invert the input values in the remap tab or just rotate the falloff, which I think is easier. Now we just need to animate the falloff. We can go back to frame one, translate in the Z axis, and type in minus 11.3, set the frame here. Go ahead more or less to the frame 90. We need at least 90 frames between the two keyframes. And here we're gonna set the Z translate to be 10.5. I don't want to see complete white here because the beans will stop moving when they're white. And I don't want to see any bean stopping in the final frame. Now let's see how is the curve in the animation editor. Here we're gonna make the animation curve we talked about. The first keyframe has to be very steep to give energy to the blast. And the second keyframe have to be very less steep, almost planar, but not really, because we don't want to give the impression that the explosion stopped expanding in the last frame. It also has to be more straight to give the impression that the speed became continuous or more linear. We can uncheck this because we don't need to see the colors. It's looking good, but we can improve on it. We can refine the speed of the beans, but I don't want to change this curve. For this, I will use this ramp. I have to enable first this fit button. This animation curve and this remap falloff curve will work together. One way to understand the relation between the two is placing one curve on top of the other. If the ramp is linear, the animation curve is not changed. But whatever we place peaks in the ramp, the animation curve will elevate. And wherever we place valleys, it will decline. So imagine this horizontal axis is the timeline. Let's mark points in the start and in the end where we want the change to happen. Now let's go to frame one. And if we go to frame two, you see how fast it expands. We need to lessen this effect. So let's decrease this first point here until we like it. Around here is good. Now let's go to frame 75. This can be a state where the points are more expanded so that we have less motion. We can change this point to be around here. Now let's add two intermediate points and place them aligned to the extreme points. And finally, I'll select these three points and set them as Bezier to make a curve. You can go back and forth until you're happy. This is my final curve and this is how it's looking. I feel pretty happy with this result so far. Now we need a camera. It will follow the explosion as it expands. So let's go back to frame one, align the view to where we want the camera to be and let's add the camera. I'm going to round this transform numbers, set this X translation to be minus 17 and keyframe it. Now let's go to frame 90 to place our last keyframe. At this point, I'd like to divide the view in two so that I can see better the camera on top view and increase the icon scale of the camera to 100. Now, as I'm moving the camera, the beans are either becoming too far away from the camera or they're getting out of the frame and we can bring most of them back into view by simply reshaping the explosion. So first let's spin this view and go to the transform node of this second moment. If we change this X scale to 1.8, I will make the explosion deeper. And if I change this Z to 0.8, it is narrower. And then we can move the camera from the outside to the inside until we see a big bean in the corner like this one. That's the point we want to keyframe. Let's watch the animation again. And it's not looking like we wanted. 
Actually, we want the camera to stop moving on frame 30 so that we can see the beans passing through it. So let's grab the last frame to 30 and fix this curve because we want the camera to follow more of the explosion. So it will have to start very fast and slow down. Let's watch it again. Okay, it is working. Just make sure that as the camera gets further away, the explosion edge gets closer to it. Now let's rotate the pieces. For each piece to have a different spin speed, we'll place a MOPS randomized node in this final moment. Let's enable randomized orientation. And this is perfect. We can keep everything as it is. Or if you want to explore different looks, try changing this seed. I'm gonna leave it as it is. Now notice that the rotation is not affecting the initial moment and the spin animation slows down with the falloff attribute and we want it to keep spinning. I tested animating this rotation multiplier here but it gives us a weird kind of motion for the spin. So let's leave it as one. To make them really spin, we can use a particle simulation. It's easier to set up than an RBD or bullet solver and it's all we need. So let's add a pop network, connect it, if we dive in, to the source, we have to set the emission type to all points and the source to be the first input. Make it be active only in the first frame using this formula. And as you can see, nothing happens, the points don't move because the points need to follow the animation I did. So we have to grab an attribute like P from SOPS into DOPS. Let's add this pop rango. Go back to the SOPS context, create a node, call it in DOPS because we're gonna reference this node copy it and paste inside the wrangle. Now let's add a vector go attribute and use the point function to retrieve the p attribute for every point of our particle simulation. And let's set a velocity attribute which is gonna be our go minus our p attribute. When we subtract two positions like this, we get as a result a vector pointing towards the first position in the subtraction, which is our go. And we want our velocity to point towards the goal so that it can follow it. And the greater the distance between our particles and the goal, the greater the velocity will be. So the velocity attribute will try to match our positions the best it can. Now, let's run the simulation again. As you can see, we need to increase the velocity because the particles are getting behind. So let's multiply this velocity by a float channel called velocity scale. Add it to the interface and set it to 10. Now let's preview it again. And it's looking better. And here outside the simulation we can't see the beans anymore because the pop network resets our instances back to regular points. But there are many ways we can solve this. One is using the transform pieces node. This node transforms all the pieces based on an attribute which by default is name and the mops instance node have created a name attribute for each instance which is what it does by default. This node also needs a geometry to transform. This will be our beans in the initial moment without any animation. So let's duplicate this node and call it in node anim because it will have no animation. If we put here an animated mesh, the animation will be double later. So let's not do it. Let's connect this to the first and the last input and our animated points go in the middle input. Now we are seeing the beans. But now we need to make some beans faster than the others. They should have random speeds. For this we need to create a random attribute from 0 to 1. And since we're using a lot of mops nodes, I'll add a mops noise falloff node to do this. Let's place it before the snow and turn preview on. And let's go to frame 4. We can keep the falloff attribute as is with the same name and it will overwrite the previous falloff attribute, no problem. Now you're seeing big shapes here, we need to break it down. So let's increase the frequency to 31. And as you can see, this range goes all the way up to white. But in the display, we don't see anything white. So let's go to the remap tab and decrease the input max until we see some white points. I'll leave it at 0.5. In this curve, let's create a little bit of a belly here because I want them to be more influenced by the falloff. Back in the wrangle, let's add two more attributes. I will copy this line and paste it twice. The first one is gonna be a float called noise and it's gonna get the mops falloff attribute. And the second is gonna be a vector four called orient and it's getting the orient attribute. Now we just need to multiply this velocity which is too uniform by this noise. And let's see how it's looking now. It's way better than before. 
And for the spin, let's create a W attribute, which by default controls the spin speed of particles. And let's set it to get the orientation of the points in SOPs. Let's visualize it again. And as you can see, the jelly beans are still spinning slowly. Let's scale the speed, so let's multiply it by a new attribute, which is a float, and it's called spin scale, and use the noise to make it random. And let's set the spin scale attribute to be 60. Okay, now they're spinning too fast, but we can animate this scale attribute to make it look exactly like we want. Let's go back to frame 15 and keyframe it, and go forward to frame 60, and lower it down to 10, keyframe it. Let's see how it's looking like. Okay, but we need this spin to slow down more abruptly, right? To help sell this slow motion effect. You see what I mean. Just follow me in this curve as I grab this second handle and make it really soft. And let's also increase the softness of this first one. And in, right here in the middle, you can see it's a lot faster and steeper. It means the speed is being more drastically reduced. Let's cook the simulation and check it out. And man, it's looking very good. And if you would like to change which beans spin faster, you can go to the mops noise. And let's increase this offset until this front bean gets white. Around here. Now as a final touch, let's make the camera roll a little bit. So we have to add a no and make the camera a child of the no. Let's go back to frame 15. Let's keyframe this X axis for the rotation. And go to frame 19, set this X rotation to 5 and keyframe it. And the handle of the second keyframe has to be more aligned with the curve to give this impression of continuity. This small change improved drastically our animation because it makes us feel like the camera is floating with the beans in the air. So we feel like we are inside it. Now you can cache or export this, do your shading, your lighting and render. There's an advanced lighting tutorial for this scene in my Patreon. And if you also want to learn how to make this sweet smoke simulation that helps sell the shot, you will have one in my Patreon as well. And if you'd like to have a free tutorial about the shading, let me know in the comments. Or if you have any questions or would have done something differently, let me know as well. I hope you have learned something new. Till the next time!